Welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys have been enjoying the show so far. We are going to go into our live portion of our keynote speakers, and then we have a live panel after that. I'm very excited to have two women back to the show. They joined us last year, and they are going to join us live in our Columbus, Ohio event at the end of August. I have Connie Matthews. She's the founder and CEO of Raycon Educational Services and Training. And I have Jana Moore, who is the Business Information Security Officer of Security Awareness at Cardinal Health. So I want to welcome both of the ladies. Thanks, ladies, for joining our show today. Our pleasure. Thank Thank you. Thanks thanks for for being here again. Excited to have you. I'm more excited that in almost a month from now, I get to meet you guys live (laughs) and at the Hyatt downtown in Columbus. How's everything going there? Are things back to normal? What's it looking like in Columbus, Ohio? Yeah, I feel like it's getting to the point where COVID, what? Oh, nice. (laughs) Um, I mean, like on the weekends, traffic's starting to go back to normal. So now you have to plan more like a half hour (laughs) instead of 10 minutes to get anywhere. But um, yeah, it seems like it's getting back to normal pretty quickly. Well, that's nice to hear. I was telling you pre-show, I was flying yesterday and I was talking to the flight attendant and I asked her if she had any idea when the masks were coming off on the airplanes. And she said on Southwest that they heard like September 13th, but now with this new strain, they're probably going to push it back. It's the only place that we have to wear masks is at the airports mm-hmm. and it's horrible because <laughs> we're all so used to not have, because I'm from St. Louis, I generally don't even have a mask anymore. I usually have to mm-hmm. get one if they require it. I imagine it's about the same there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, why don't you, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, do one of you guys want to talk about what you guys are going to be discussing today? And then um, I'll throw it over to you. I do want to let everyone know, please um, submit your questions in the chat box because uh, Jana and Connie will be taking your questions during the show. And I will come back at the end to wrap up with any additional questions and we'll do Q&A at the end. But with that being said, if one of you guys want to let our audience know what you're speaking on, and then I'll throw it over to you guys. Jana, do you want to go ahead and kick kick us off? Sure. Yeah. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, really excited to spend some time with you this morning talking about this topic. It's actually one that um, has been talked about more frequently lately, which is a really nice trend to see, even though this role has been around for a while. So when we talk about kind of the business information security officer space, um, security partnering closer with the business, um, how do you establish those relationships? What does that look like? How do you influence the business? Um, and that, and, and coupled with that comes a lot of education that has to occur. And how are you training the business and getting them um, up to speed with some of the security requirements and what it means to them in their day-to-day world? So it's been this really interesting evolution that we've seen um, over the last few years, and it's starting to pop up more frequently in, in a lot of these events that we're all starting to attend, um, which is great. So at, in a nutshell, that's, that's where we're going to be talking about is kind of that emergence of, of these roles and, and what that means to the business and that relationship and then the training aspect of it as well. Great. So Thanks, Jenna. Yeah. yeah. So um, if it's okay with everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to just kind of ask questions back and forth between the two of us. Um, And we'll, you know, have input probably on the questions that we asked you. So I'm going to go ahead and get started um, with the first question. And it's obviously for Jana. So why do you think the broader conversation um, and what has driven organizations to consider expanding the leadership roles and specifically the BISO, uh, Business Information Security Officer, within organizations? Yeah, it's, um, it's been interesting to watch the different size of organizations starting to layer in um, the different roles. So whether it's chief security officer, chief information security officer, the deputy CISO, and now you see the BISO popping up more frequently. <clears throat> it's, it's really a combination of, a, of several things that's, um, that, that businesses are, or may, that are kind of putting them in that direction to make these changes to the leadership ranks. And it's, You know, a combination of the growing complexity of their business models, for example, you know, every company is going to be a little bit different. So depending on what their needs are, it could be um, kind of um, going in that direction because of their complexity. 
and they need to have focused leadership, um, spending time with the business at different levels. Um, there's growing capabilities coming out of the information security space. So as you see companies maturing their information security capabilities and their team size is growing and they're expanding what they're doing for the business, it starts to uh, require um, different levels of leadership to, to provide that guidance and vision and strategy and focus. And then you also have, you know, the threat landscape is changing and it's changed so much. I mean, the past, the velocity of change over the last, I would just say five to 10 years, um, I'm in healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry, and especially with, with what we're seeing in healthcare, um, the threat landscape is really dictating a lot of that need to have that focused leadership who's remaining in the know of what is occurring outside of our our walls, if you will, and what does that mean to our industry and how do we need to position ourselves to um, stay ahead of it, defend against it, stay educated on it, helping the business understand what these risks are and how they're changing. Um, and then the need to have speed and that, that kind of divide and conquer mentality. Um, I think again, you know, with not just from a threat landscape perspective, but also privacy, there's a lot of privacy changes that are occurring especially in the U.S. And so it's, you know, these roles are really, it's, it's kind of this complex web of, of between policies and standards and, and audits and benchmarking that you're having done to see where you stand in relationship to your peers um, in your industry, outside of your industry, understanding what your requirements are from a regulation standpoint. Um, are you doing risk analysis internally for your business units? Um, you know, and those, those are sort of the things that, that really drive that, that need to partner more closely with the business teams, um, because you really do have to spend time together and, and get ahead of the strategy and vision and so, so that you can make sure that you're lined up together and that you can help navigate the landscape real time, you know, instead of kind of, you know, the business having their strategy from a business standpoint, and then the IT and security needs are kind of followed behind it. Um, so that's that's another reason why you see um, the varying degrees or levels of this leadership. And then that engagement with the security community and being connected with um, the government and lawmakers, your peers across industries, staying informed and aware of incidents that are happening in the news. You know, a lot of times your business teams, they're seeing the, the national news, the world news, and they're seeing the, the ransomware events occurring, um, breaches occurring. And a lot of times they don't, they don't necessarily know what questions to ask, but they, they're interested. They want to know what does this mean to us? What does it mean to our business? And how are we protecting ourselves from this happening? So the broader conversation and kind of driving your organization, depending on where you are, um, it could be a combination of any one of those things, but it, it really is kind of illustrating that the, the information security topic in general, general terms, is is absolutely in the forefront in that it's, it's a conversation that you should be having. Yeah, those are really good points. And, you know, one of the things um, Jana and myself and a few others, we did a keynote um, in Columbus um, late summer. And one of the things that I'm excited to, to really talk about is that, you know, eventually, like really we just had chief information security officer and a lot of companies didn't even have that. So as people progress in their career, there was a very limited amount of opportunity. So now with the chief security officer, the chief information security officer, the deputy CISO and the BISO, it really allows organizations to expand those leadership roles. Um, and because the things are changing so quickly and rapidly, you need really an army of people to support that. And, you know, that kind of brings me into the next question for Jana is, you know, how do you build... Uh, relationships between security and the business side of the house. And obviously as a BISO, I really feel like you have to kind of have your feet in both sides of the business and the security industry, because a lot of times security can be complex and we use a lot of acronyms and terminology that the business doesn't understand. So having that partnership between the business um, the BISO and the actual business is super important. So Jana, can you throw out some ideas potentially um, that you think would be assets in your role and what makes um, a person in your role be successful? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's one of those kind of, if you haven't had that relationship prior to entering into a, a BSO um, organizational model, it's, it, you're not real sure kind of how to approach that situation. You know, hopefully that you have some existing relationship, perhaps if you've been at the company for any length of time that you can leverage. But if you, if you don't, really building that relationship and identifying those, those key partners is step one. And what we learned at Cardinal is we have not only a, you know, the way that we're structured at Cardinal, we're, we're a global company. We have three main segments. So we have med, the medical segment, the pharmaceutical segment, and then we have the corporate segment. And within those segments, then we have ge geographies. Then we have EMEA, we have LATAM, we have APAC in North America. So we have a lot of different business units to be keeping our eyes on. So under my team, so I play the role as, as the kind of the global BSO that covers all of those. And my team is aligned to those each individual either segments or geographies. And so when we put this team together a couple of years ago and we put together our strategy, it was about a three-year strategy. Step one, which was a good nine, nine, 10 months uh, first step was build relationships. Don't do anything else. Don't come in with policies or trying to get them to understand what security, um, what we're trying to drive out of security or what our strategy is. It really is you go in, you, you meet the folks, you understand what matters to them. What is important to them? What are their priorities? What are your priorities over the next quarter? What are your priorities of the, over this fiscal year? What are your goals? What are some of your pain points? Um, and just listen and really start. And it's funny, and I say this kind of in jest, but truth, truthfully, we all said, say yes to everything. Whatever they ask, say yes to everything because you want them to understand that you are there as a trusted partner and an advocate for them as the business, as opposed to the other way around, where you typically have when IT, you know, information security under that IT umbrella, when they're reaching out, it's, it's usually because they need something from the business. They need you to do something. There's going to be some sort of disruption that might occur um, because of something that we're doing. And, and you really need them to understand that as a BSO, you're there to be an advocate for them and help them navigate how to be compliant, what, what compliant, compliance requirements pertains to, the, to pay, pertains to their business, how are they doing against that bar, where do we need to close some gaps. And so you're really there to kind of help them stay safe, compliant, and at least in the know enough to be able to make some good business decisions around risk. Because at the end of the day, that's really what the BSO, the CISO, the deputy CISO, the CISO, we're, we're all managing risk, you know, and, and that's really where the conversation needs to go and be kind of revolve around. And so one thing that we noticed um, in those first 10 months of don't do anything else but build relationships um, was that we were listening and we, we found that we first were entering that world being their BSO. And then we realized, well, part of the time we're actually a counselor and part of the time we're actually a matchmaker and then we're kind of a translator and now we're a traffic cop and now we're an advocate and now we're a navigator. So we actually be, became this kind of utility player for our business units and our, the leaders over there because we were filling a gap that we, we didn't know at our company at Cardinal, we, didn't, we were filling a gap that we didn't really know that we had. And so while we were there thinking we were going to be their security advocate, help them navigate, we actually were filling a broader role of just helping them navigate IT altogether. And because we had those relationships, we come from that side of the world, we have those relationships behind us, it was a matter of connecting them with the right folks. And so getting those questions answered, what are your pain points, helping them close up those pain points to make their lives easier, at least off the get-go. So when we talk about how do you build the relationships between security and the business, you don't really get down to business right off the bat, is my, is my advice, is you really need to spend the time. And it will pay off if you do have patience. You instill that confidence in, in, in them and in the relationship. Um, you're going to help them make those informed decisions related to risk and security, accepting the risk and what that means to them that there are trade-offs, what are the options? And so it, it, it turns away from being this 
um, kind of on or off answer to you're helping them manage through the gray, right? There's a lot of gray and, and it's, there's not always just one right answer. So it's an interesting evolution now that we're into it. Um, the first couple of years, those relationships now have brought us to the table and we are now being proactively included in more of the strategy and vision discussions when we're talking about where the business is uh, positioning themselves. Um, what does that mean to us from a supply chain perspective, for example? Um, security, can you weigh in on that? Um, hey, we're, we're manufacturing a new product that we want to take to market. Are we following the FDA requirements that are needed that we, that, you know, pre-market, post-market, what, how are they changing? You know, there's just so many different avenues that security layers over business initiatives. And so now we've been able to reap the benefits of building that relationship. Perfect. So it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, one is who does the BISO report to? Um, and Jenna, you can share your thoughts too. I'm kind of seeing a different structure depending on the organization. Um, some will report to a deputy, some will to the CISO, and some to the chief security officer. Um, and then Jenna, you can maybe talk a little bit about yeah. your structure. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that I spent some time on a couple of years ago before I established the team is I reached out to about seven or eight different CISOs, um, both within healthcare and without, and just kind of asked them, what's working for you? How do you have it organizationally structured? Um, any thoughts on, you know, would you do it differently if you could do it over again? And I would say the majority of them, and including us, um, we re I report directly to the CISO, the global CISO for the company. And really what that's allowed us to do is the BISOs now can provide that, that layered kind of layers of visibility back to the CISO organization where our CISO can then spend time with the executive leaders and the board and making sure that we have the right uh, reporting and metrics and that the right story is being told there. And then we're filling in those gaps from a business standpoint of what are the trends we're seeing? What are some of the questions that are coming up? Here's where the business is talking about going um, and just filling in some, some blanks there for, for our CISO. Um, but then again, I talked to some CISOs where they had it um, distributed out into the business and reporting into the business unit leadership themselves. And the feedback that I received on that structure was while it made sense at the time for them, um, they, they found where, um, what do they say, where, where um, there's that syndrome, Stockholm syndrome, where they almost become too aligned to the business, where they, they almost are leaning too heavy towards giving the business some uh, flexibility that they maybe shouldn't be taking or risk that they shouldn't be taking. And it's actually not good business decision making occurring because of that. And that they need to get back to kind of balancing the risk and security um, strategy and requirements with the business requirements and finding that happy medium. So in their case, they said they wish they would have had it aligned closer to the CISO. But it all depends on, the, on your company, what the appetite is for it, what's your culture, um, how in tune are the business leaders uh, with security, you know, how, how supportive are they of the strategy coming out of the CISO's office. So it just depends. And then it looks like we have two more questions. So um, one, and uh, what's the question, does a business need both a CISO and a BISO? Um, and absolutely, they do need both because as Jana just kind of described, um, the CISO is looking at a lot more than just the business. They're looking at, you know, globally what's going on within an organization. And in smaller organizations, the CISO may also have the role of a BISO, but would it be one person? Um, but the structure, you know, you definitely would need like a chief security officer or, or chief information security officer. Um, because you like if you had to relate to the business and then fight all the financial battles all by yourself, that's a lot for someone mm -hmm. um, to undertake. And honestly, just because, as Jana mentioned, so much has changed. Um, and I've been in technology for a super long time, and I feel like security changes even faster than technology. Um, and it's really tough to have that touch point and vision of all the different things um, that needs to need to occur in the security industry. And then Jenna, if you want to add anything and I'll look kind of at the next question while you're answering too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, having both was a really good move for us because I'll tell you, when I look back over our maturity as, a, as an information security organization, the first like 
five to eight years of putting in that foundational program, we spent a lot of time with our IT partners. And so our, our partners in the, in the company were really just IT. Um, we had not kind of stepped over that boundary and, and extended our, our services out to the business because we were in, and it was needed to spend that much time with our IT partners to get this platform um, installed, get them implemented, get them tuned, making sure the right logging and visibility and all of the foundational pieces that go into a program. But now that we had it established, it was okay. Now we're ready to take the next step. And so having the CISO continue to own kind of that partnership with the, the head, the CIO, right? And be partners very closely with all the CIOs in the company, understanding where they're trying to go to enable the business from a strategic um, IT standpoint. And then again, like Connie said, then we could then layer in kind of those business strategy um, discussions to make sure that we are fully um, informed on where the businesses are going. And how do we make sure that that IT strategy is lining up with the business strategies? And that needs to occur at all levels. That is always occurring at the top level, right? You can be assured that the top levels of your company is having that discussion. But a lot of the time, that doesn't filter down through the rest of the organization. And so the BISO helps with that middle section. You know, we make sure that the middle leaders and their teams are well aware of how those two strategies are supporting each other. So that's how it's worked really well for us. Thanks, Janet. And then our next question is, by going to the business and saying a blanket yes is definitely a good relationship builder between IT and the business units. However, how do you manage the relationship if your yes turns into a no because of security concerns? Yeah, no, that's a great call. And, and I think what we've learned is that there really isn't and there, I can maybe think at one time that there's any reason to have a no. And that's only because there are so many different ways to solve the problem. And so we become problem solvers with our business partners in terms of, okay, this is a vendor. Let's take third-party uh, risk, for example. That's a really big topic for us. We have a ton of vendors that we use. And let's say they want to bring in a new vendor that doesn't have the level of security that we would like to see. Well, maybe in the past, maybe when we were less mature, we would say things like, okay, you can't use that vendor. You know, they don't meet our, our minimum requirements. Well, today it's, it's kind of, let's understand what that relationship is going to be like with that vendor. What are the services? Are they, what are they offering us? Are they accessing any of our systems? Are they accessing any data? Let's, let's really understand the, the whole conceptual kind of risk of what we're talking about. We have a basic risk analysis model that we, we leverage to run the business through some initial questions to understand level of risk, impact, uh, frequency, what would be um, kind of the loss event if something were to happen. So we can have a, a more fruitful conversation to find, okay, maybe the answer is not no, but it's, hey, go back to your vendor and say, sure, we can, uh, we can enter into a relationship with you, but we need to see your roadmap for perhaps putting in multi-factor authentication if you're going to be accessing our systems. And until you do that, we're not going to um, go in that that far into our service agreement. We'll do these things. And then once you put these in place, then we'll move on to the next. So it, there's really not a lot of examples I can give of where we've had to say no. Um, if, if it does come down to a hard no, that's where you start to elevate the risk decision making in your business. And that's where the business then takes ownership of accepting the risk mm -hmm. and saying, okay, I'm informed. This um, the benefit of doing this for our business outweighs that risk. And so I'm going to accept that risk as the, as the leader of the business unit. We document it. And that's the, that's the answer. So while they you know, are accepting the risk, that may look like a no for us, but um, it's actually a good business uh, relationship and discussion that we're having. And Jen, I think because you know, when you think about relationships, I think it's easier to have a soft no than a like draw a line in the mm -hmm. sand no. Um, and a lot of times we all know, especially in security, there's compensating controls, workarounds. And I think it's really smart that you're evaluating your, your partners outside of Cardinal based on risk because a lot of times 
some of the things that are required just don't make sense for a third party because they're not accessing, you know, client data or internal data. So great points. Um, so, Jenna, we kind of already answered um, our third question, so I'll just go okay. into uh, the fourth one. And it's basically as you perform table tops, what changes have you made involving the business slash executive leadership? Why do you think changes are essential to the business? And do you can you maybe suggest any type of platforms or tabletop mm -hmm. um, partnerships that you have that are helping um, you do that job a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And I'm hoping that the things that we're talking about today are actionable things that the audience can can take and see how it might fit within your business. Because tabletops have really turned into this um, good facilitator of discussion of process uh, response planning, business continuity with the business. Um, we always have action items that come out of our tabletop. Um, some of the larger tabletops that we do with the top level executives of the business areas will have a, a third party come in and facilitate some of those just because of the audience and, and, and kind of walking them through some of the thought processes and what they see occurring in the environment. But um, actually what we're looking to do is take the tabletop um, activity and start kind of filtering that down into the business units even further so that they can start to understand what are their critical business processes that run their kind of neck of the woods or area, you know, space in the world. And if they had a cyber event, first of all, do they know what their business continuity plans are? Are they, are they documented? A lot of times they know what they are. They just don't have them documented. And so this is a good way to facilitate hey, we probably need to get this down on paper. Let's make sure everyone's aware of where that is. But then it's also to identify the communication um, cadence. Almost, I bet nine times out of 10, when we do tabletop, communication is one of the top action items that comes out because it's everyone knows how to communicate, but it's when do you communicate? What do you communicate? When do you communicate externally? Do you have to communicate externally? Do we have our partners engaged from a, um, kind of retainer standpoint, if we have a, a large event, do we know how to engage those, those third parties? Do we need to go through legal first? So you almost start to get to this point where you create a flow chart, like a, a flow diagram, really on paper of if this happens, then do this. And so the tabletop, since we can't, we can't pay for a facilitator to come in every single time and, and it's a little expensive, we've actually chosen to use a platform called Immersive Labs, which is amazing because of the flexibility that it starts to give us as the facilitator where it comes with a lot of out-of-the-box scenarios already loaded. So if you just want to use a scenario that they have for a cyber event and it will prompt questions, it'll track responses and give a scoring system on how well um, the audience did in terms of choosing the right action to take or if you have your own scenario in your mind that you want to use for your company that's more uh, tailored to your business model and uses your language your jargon that would resonate a little bit more with your business team then you can absolutely go in and create your own scenario with your own question and answer q a and you can track those answers and have a readout at the end and so to see something like that come on the market for us was it's going to be, it's going to help us take it to the next level, right? We're going to be able to have even more interesting discussions that we're, we're doing more proactively instead of waiting for an event to happen and then trying to get everyone together. So we're excited to use, to use that. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we have another quick question. How do you initiate strategizing and planning for your security organization? So that's a great question. So, um, if we're talking about strategy within our organization and not with the business, so if we're looking at the strategy within, um, so we align ourselves to the NIST framework. So that's what we use um, to measure ourselves against um, the five different category, categories there. And when we look at our strategy, we're always aligning our work to which category that it's going to be improving. And then we, we also take into account from our last assessment against the NIST framework, where are we currently in our maturity? And so with those few things, coupled with what's happening in the threat landscape, what are some of the internal and external pressures are we facing? 
we marry all that together to come up with the point of view of how does that then change the priority of what we need to go after for second and third. And of course, things can change because depending on what's happening in the threat landscape, or maybe a business decision was made, um, we can absolutely have some flexibility to reorder some things, but we typically go in with a thoughtful um, workshop planning discussion of where are we today with our NIST framework? Where are we trying to get to? What's our end state from a maturity standpoint? You know, and then what are the work activities or projects that we're going to start to perform to move that needle? Because we have to be able to track where are we moving the needle um, and what benefit is that creating? And so that's what we're doing right now. Um, we refresh that every couple of years. And so we just actually came off of a recent NIST assessment again to kind of reassess where are we from a NIST framework and then how are these projects going to enhance where we are today so that's hopefully that answered that question yeah that's great and then i think that's kind of a great leeway too because jana under your role you also have the training and awareness piece and when you look at a lot of the new legislation and regulations coming out are now requiring a certain amount of training that's definitely more hands-on than just learning concepts taking it beyond concepts and then you know when you look at the Gartner's top 10, you know, priorities, number nine talks about developing your teams and those types of things. And because we're moving so fast, um, you know, just kind of talking more about the importance of training and development. So now I luckily get to, uh, to turn over, um, Jan's going to ask me a couple questions. Yeah, and again, please let me keep up table. with the, yeah, please um, send, keep sending the questions. We love to be able to be interactive with everyone. Yeah, so let's turn the table a little bit. You know, Connie, with your position and your company, and, and you see a lot of the different trends and what companies are doing in terms of training and education, you know, how important is training and development, you know, to building teams today in security, whether it's entry level, intermediate, advanced? What solutions do you suggest reviewing? You know, how, what's the approach that you're starting to see companies take? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, one of the ones that I prefer working with my clients with is really a blended solution. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, all of your learners basically learn differently. So I think that you think when you consider some people are better self-paced, self-learning, some people need instructor-led. And so what I generally work with is just kind of putting together solutions where we could potentially look at lunch and learns. We can do lab-based, you know, two-day, three-day, four-day classes. I mean, I know um, Jana mentioned Immersive Labs, and I also partner with Immersive Labs, and they have a very robust skill-based training um, that is really working great because they're, it's really hard to sometimes build an ROI on training. And when you look at something like Immersive, where they have really robust um, reporting on the back end, and you can actually set career objectives um, I think that's really important. And one of the reasons I think training is one of the most important things as we're looking at building teams is that when a lot of bigger companies do surveys, one of the things that comes back almost every time is training and development. And things are changing so fast. And there are people that are going to learn on their own, but you can't expect your teams to spend all their personal time learning. And we also know that a lot of the attack scenarios are always revolving and evolving as time goes on. And so it's so important um, so that you, at the end of the day, if you have well-trained people and, and, you know, I'm not all about certification necessarily, but sometimes it makes sense for certifications. It's really for me more knowledge that they can use in their organizations. It's really important to make sure you have that in there because it, you know, it is proven like there, you know, sometimes you may have a breach and, it's a SQL injection. My quest, my first question to organizations is what have you done to train your app developers on app security? And I just know from a lot of conversations, there is no training around that. So you can't expect an app developer that's never learned app security to write secure code and to think about those considerations. And with the movement of the cloud, I mean, to me, the cloud is just a huge application in all intents and purposes. All of our security is moving to the cloud and app, and we really have a main shortage of app security people. So what can we do to develop our teams 
inside an organization. And maybe they're not going to end up being app security people, but if you have advocates and champions within the app dev teams, it's going to make security's job much easier to have in those conversations and engage. Yeah, I think one other point that I know you and I have talked about before too is almost like this um, kind of professional skill of taking security people and teaching them kind of how to sell security and how to talk about security at different levels in the, mm-hmm. in the business. You know, you know, personally, it's, it's also opening up kind of a career path. If you can, if you can help them have different discussions and understand how to um, kind of translate security into different terms, then you can start to bridge that gap, like you said, across app security folks, to the business and other areas um, as well. You know, and the one thing I didn't mention too is, you know, we have a lot of training out there that is just muscle memory, theory based. And, you know, you need to understand that. But if you can't take theory into practice, it makes it really challenging. And furthermore, one of the things I think is you're looking to build training programs is making sure some of those soft skills are included. So let's just say you did a pen test course. Maybe the last day you have some of the leadership that the tech team needs to report to. They have to re, they have to basically report those findings to the leadership team um, because I think we can all agree. I mean, it's not a secret. A lot of technical people don't understand the business and they don't necessarily always know how to communicate. They have good intentions, but if you start throwing every acronym out and all these deep technical issues, you've you've already lost them. And so it's so important to build both those technical and soft skills, the creative thinking, the critical thinking, and all of those types of things um, that are important as you build security teams. Yeah. So let me ask you another question around um, talent and kind of assessing and, and investing in your people. How, how do you assess talent how, you know, so that you know how to invest in your people? What, what do you see happening out there? So that one's really challenging. I think there's a lot of solutions out there that are okay, but it's not super robust. Um, And I think you have to find, you know, a a specific solution and not that we're trying to just bring up immersive labs. And one of honestly, the reasons I partnered with them is you can actually start to assess your team um, and you can, you know, set objectives um, for them and they can set objectives if they want to learn more And it's sometimes it's really challenging to build an ROI on training and development. And so there with, with that particular situation, you can start to do that. Um, But what I have found, you know, from a lot of conversations with some really big companies is that a lot of times they write their own, but it's really manual and it takes a lot to do it. So, you know, it kind of, it's, it's really based on the, the aptitude that you have and what you have the ability to do. And nothing against training groups or HR groups, it's going to be challenging for them to do that without a lot of input from the security groups because they're not going to understand all of those things. And I'll give you an example of how this could be a challenge. A lot of times when HR goes out to do like evaluations on what a certain role would pay, they'll put in like a security analyst. And actually a lot of times what comes back are a business analyst and a systems analyst And to be quite frank, they're just not paid the same. And so it's not that competitive market. And that's an example of just how terminology means so many different things within the industries that you're working in. But I would, you know, honestly say that you, it's really important, I think, for us to build success stories for people and succession paths. I feel in the security industry, that's where we've been lacking. You either are a practitioner or a leader. And I know a lot of organizations are looking at individual leaderships that they don't actually manage a team because they're not people leaders. Um, And that can obviously be really challenging. So you have to kind of take a step back and look at your organization. What are your objectives and your goals to develop your team? And from there, you can, you know, can engage with someone that can help support that efforts. Um, You know, like I said, my company does a lot of that stuff, but I'm certainly not telling you to come to me. There's lots of other companies and you really need to find that trusted advisor to support those efforts. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the key point there is around training and education, both internal to your information security team is important, but then also outside of your information security team is making sure that you have the right conversations and you're putting in processes that can do that secure code scanning and, and 
get the adoption on the application side so that they um, they understand what the pipeline looks like, they understand how to make sure that they're staying secure right off the, you know, the, the bat um, before they're delivering any products or services or what have you to the market. Um, and then similar with the business is making sure that you're, when you're partnering with the business, there is that element of education and helping them just raise their level of understanding of what this, what security is and what it means to them and how it impacts their decision making. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, and by, sh- I can't really see anyone, but I was just going to say by show of hands, but <laughs> one of the biggest challenges that I see right now are that on the app security space and the cloud security space, and I I mean, I know several companies, and we're both in Columbus, but almost everybody's hiring app security people, and they really just don't exist, and they're also a very expensive uh, resource, and so what I'm seeing a lot is working with app you know, that the security folks and then bringing the app dev teams in and starting to really put together training where security is part of the SDLC, Waterfill, Agile, whatever methodology you'll, you use and building that in from the very beginning, because I think we can all agree that in security, if you if security is an afterthought, um, it's problematic when you're looking at code and applications and deploying things because if it's not done right from the beginning, that may mean going back and completely re-architecting an entire application um, over, you know, little things. And, you know, you think about the OWASP top 10, they really, it really hasn't changed in many, many, many years. They rotate a little bit, they've collapsed them, but that just tells us we're not paying attention to app security as a whole. Um, And every organization that I've worked with, we all struggle with that. And so, I think with the adoption of cloud and everything moving forward, that seems to be the area that I think organizations need the most help with. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. You know, one thing I was just thinking about while you were talking is um, that relationship and education piece with the business. And one thing I'll leave, I want to make sure that I get across to the audience is even if you don't have a a formal, you know, BSO um, model, within your organization, that doesn't mean that you can't have these conversations and start developing that skill set and that muscle, if you will, and start identifying, kind of mapping out who are your key partners? How often should you be meeting with them? How can you maybe do some educational um, kind of presentations to them and their team, maybe on a quarterly basis, and just start establishing a relationship and kind of performing that function as a, of a BSO, but um, you will get the value out of it and you'll get the benefit. You'll be able to reap the benefits and pulling them closer. And, and over time, they will become an advocate um, on behalf of security. And so then you have some you have them embedded right in the business and starting to kind of continue on that discussion um, and open doors for your team to get out there a little bit more. Yeah, and I think in large organizations, I mean, Jana Cardinal is one of these where they ha- they realize the importance of recruiting in, in, in Columbus, 270 is the loop road. And we joke, it's literally just stealing talent and it's this vicious circle. And so we need to like step back and figure out how do we develop our new teams. Um, and part of that is, you know, if you can hire within the internal team. So like you're taking your network operation centers and moving them into a security operation center. That makes a whole lot of sense because they already know the fundamentals. Now you're just adding and it's almost like with Legos, you just continue to build blocks till you get to where you want to be. Um, and then if you're not a large organization that has that, you should definitely look in your communities. There's all kinds of programs um, and partnering with them, or maybe they can add a security component. Like we have um, several coding groups here. Um, and then we have Perscolis who focuses on um, underserved um, population. And a lot of the companies here partner with them for talent. Um, and then we've been talking to them a lot about maybe adding some security components um, because we have to find creative ways to hire people. Um, and I think we can all agree. I always laugh when I see an entry-level security position and they ask for a CISSP cert. And I'm like, well, mm-hmm. you can't get that until you're in the industry for five years. So that's not an entry level position. And so taking a look back at what you're trying to do and building that talent internally or finding outsourced sources that can support those efforts is super important. 
Yeah. And getting a good relationship established with your recruiting team, you know, if that's through your HR team and really helping them understand how to write these, these roles Mm -hmm. so that you're really attracting the, the right talent and you're not restricting yourself by putting language in there. That's, um, kind of, you know, weeding people out uh, too early in the process. So that's also important to have that relationship. Well, I think we're about 10 minutes left, I believe. And um, so Kim, if you want to come back on and if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer any questions. And um, we always have fun doing this. And hopefully some of the insights we gave were helpful. And, um, you know, certainly, Uh, you can reach out to us on LinkedIn, um, or if anyone wants our contact information, we can certainly provide that. So thank you for having us. I am trying to come back in and the, the, I think they have me, I think they have me, uh, ah, there I am. Okay. It sounds like, um, it sounds like they have answered every question, but, um, but let me just make sure we're not missing any. You guys have been super informative. Um, so I don't know if somebody asked this, but what would your suggestion be, Jana, for the smaller companies? And it's interesting because we do a CISO happy hour. It's been this vir- uh, virtual happy hour. And it's one of the questions is, what are you currently doing with some of your security training, especially if they don't have a BSO, and I would think with some of the smaller companies, they don't have the budget for that. So what is some of your suggestions for those medium-sized companies that don't have that in their budget? What kind of training would you suggest, like as far as them being interacted with with, uh, non-security teams? Yeah, I I think it probably goes back to that, you know, just because you don't have the model or the funding to create a specific dedicated role for the BSO, I would say that should not prevent you from um, kind of wearing that dual hat of taking on that responsibility um, and, you know, in a, in a formal way, you know, just kind of understanding kind of roles and responsibilities, of course. But I think that there's, there shouldn't be anything preventing you from, um, establishing those on your own and then making sure that you understand what are the priorities of the business and how do you make sure that everyone feels informed and aligned and that um, the business sees that, that the security teams have an appreciation for either the, the speed at, their, at which they're moving their business, the direction that they're moving the business. And, uh, and, and seeing the security team having business acumen is going to be a good, a really good trust builder because it sees that you're, it shows them that you are investing in understanding business. And so from a training perspective, um, I think there's a lot of value in the security team understanding business. And so if there's any sort of internal kind of course that so you could have someone from the business come over and give a course to the security team about business, whether it's accounting or finance or, or what have you. And that way, there's a, at least a foundational knowledge of how the business operates and what's that profit and loss you know, statement. What, why does that matter? How does that influence decision making? And, and what would that mean to a security um, person? You know, so I think that there's a bi-directional education that can be happening there. So that's another opportunity where you really don't need a lot of funding. It's just time, time and effort. And I had a few of the CISOs and these, these would be some larger companies. Cause I know there was like blue cross blue shield. He was on there and you know, they, they were talking about how they have cybersecurity days, you know, once a quarter and they're rewarding, you know, just the non tech people of the company. If they pass these tests, you know, they're, they're getting some pretty cool prizes and it makes them want to participate and learning more about cybersecurity. And I would have to think with some of these latest ransomware attacks, the big ones, is it opening up the C levels and the board members to we need to do a little bit more than have a small security team. What's your mm-hmm. thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the education aspect of educating the board is um, just as important so that we're all on the same page. We all have the same mm-hmm. kind of philosophy on when an event happens at our company. We are all aligned and on the same page that an event will happen but how do we minimize the impact of that? And so when you are educating the board and having those discussions, 
that's when they really start to kind of um, get more comfortable with, okay, this makes sense why we need to be investing in X, Y, and Z. And let's make sure that we have the right pieces in place to not only protect our systems and data, but also the people. Um, how are we educating the human? You know, how are we managing security and risk as an organization? So I think it's, it's really all levels. It, it really does have to become part of the culture. And so once that starts to happen and you have the support of the top level executives or leaders of the board, um, it, the rest really starts to fall into place is what I've seen because you do have that support and the conversation starts to change. And how long, how, okay, I'm sorry, I, Connie, I was just going to say, how long have you been the BSO there? Like when did they create that role at Cardinal Health? So our first role that we created was in EMEA because of some of the GDPR requirements and needs of that particular business unit. And that was about two and a half, three years ago. And then I came into the role as the as the um, as leading the team to build the rest of the team um, right at let's see like October 2019 right before COVID. And then so we then went into 2020 COVID hit and then we staffed the whole organization remotely um, around the globe. So that's that's how long I've been in this role. Go ahead, Connie. I think you had a question. Oh, yeah, I was just going to add to what Janice on awareness, you know, what's interesting is a lot of bigger organizations are creating um, awareness programs, and they're actually hiring marketing and salespeople um, many times just because I think we've learned kind of like, well, if you're going to get fired, if you have three phishing attacks or whatever, and that kind of that threat model to being more creative and, and engaging and coming at from their perspective, because I always say, you know, if if one of like they asked us to do brain surgery, I had one person say I'd Google it. Well, I'm pretty sure none of us would want someone that Googled how to do brain surgery. So we also have to understand the messaging has to be in a sense where people buy in and in, including like their personal and professional lives, which mingles so much anyway because of technology. Um, having that different perspective, and you know, if you don't have an awareness program, it might make sense to sit down with your marketing people and your HR people. Um, because they kind of understand the culture across the board and working with them to do some really cool initiatives that people are engaged with. Yeah, I agree. Because, you know, I, I don't think, you know, the culture of firing your staff when there's a phishing attack is working too much anymore. I think yeah. <laughs> so. Um, anyway, are there any last, let me make sure there are. No other questions. Tons and tons of people just saying fantastic session, the synergy between the business needs to be security requirements is vital and just over and over tons of people. Thank you for this presentation. Very insightful. It is definitely, I, I feel like since COVID, I've been seeing BSOs more that, you know, that role more in our attendees. And, you know, since our attendees are all cybersecurity people, that certainly has become a new um, title that we've seen in the last year, especially, you know, since COVID, we, we would see it a little bit pre-COVID. So I think it's becoming a more and more relevant role that is necessary for the rest of the teams to understand what's going over because like our website says, you know, IT, you know, IT is no longer an, I, you know, cybersecurity is no longer an IT problem. Yeah. So is there any last um, words that each of you guys might want to give our uh, viewers something to leave with, something to that they can take today and use in their everyday life? Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, I would say the one thing I'll leave you with that we've really learned um, and we kind of, we, we went into it with um, the thought around how do we tell the story? And so, you know, earlier when I was talking about the BISO role, I talked about how we were filling all these different roles of being a counselor and a matchmaker and navigator. A storyteller is actually one of the most significant skills that, has become so valuable for us because you really do need to be able to translate what's happening in security and become a storyteller to your audience so that they leave there with an understanding of what does this mean to me? Um, what does it mean to our company? And what are some actions that I can take 
to do to do better, do different, whatever it is that you need them to do. But um, it's using analogies and, and making it relevant, you know, making it memorable to them. So really spend time about thinking about that, the storytelling piece. And then my last thoughts would be really just, you know, learn the art of listening um, because the business does not want to intentionally harm the business. You know, they really want to be a partner, but many times security teams are they, you know, we always joke around the, the department of no, it can't be that it has to be, how do we collaborate to help make their jobs easier in some ways. And just really listening to me is one of the most important things, because if you never listen, you're never going to understand their pains or where they need to go um, and make them look like champions. Because at the end of the day, as a security person, if we see them successful around the information security and all of the things we have to worry about, that in turn makes us more successful individually, collectively, and as a company. Well, okay, Connie Matthews <laughs> from uh, Raycon Training and Jana Moore from Cardinal Health. Thank you so much for all of you, um, anyone out here that is from Ohio or the Indiana area. They are going to be live with us and they'll be um, sitting on that panel, a live panel with a happy hour where we can all network again. That's August 26th, Thursday, August 26th. Very much looking forward to um, seeing them in person and meeting them in person because I feel like all I do is see you guys on Zoom meetings. So, anyway, I think we're all that way. Yeah. So, excited well, thank you about for having that. us. It's yeah, always a you. pleasure to yeah. talk to people and share our passion. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank thanks, you. everyone. So, we are going to take a short break right now.